In the northeastern corner of Brazil, 500 kilometers inland from the sea, the sun rises over a landscape that is totally different from any other in the country. This is the heart of Brazil's dry zone, a vast area of territory where the rainfall is low and unreliable. Only a semi-desert kind of natural vegetation survives. This landscape is called Kachinga. Crops can grow here, but every 10 years or so, the rainfall drops way below average and the harvest fails. The dry zone, Brazil's poorest region, becomes a drought zone, and poorer still. Pau Feru is a small village in the Kachinga, 100 kilometers from the nearest town. After two years of poor rainfall, the village wells have run dry and many people have given up and moved away. Now the villagers' only source of water is a stagnant pond that built up against the road embankment during the last downpour six months ago in February. Carminha da Silva is the eldest daughter of one of the families still pressing on through the drought in Pau Ferro. Carminha's family used this water for washing, cooking and drinking. Carminha's brothers are bringing in firewood, the one and only item Pau Ferro will get from the land this year. <laughs> During the 40 years or so that Carminha's mother has lived in the dry zone, she's been through four big droughts. She is used to long periods of time when there's not enough to eat. This year, she said, the family will make do with beans and rice once a day, goat meat once a fortnight, green vegetables never. The water from the roadside pond has to make do for every domestic purpose. Boiled and mixed with flour, it's all Mrs. De Silva has to give her younger children. The De Silvas have grown accustomed to the harsh place they live in. Illness and death are almost part of everyday life. Mrs. De Silva is especially tough. We asked her how many children she's had. I had 15. 10 are still alive. How did the children die? The first one died of dysentery and vomiting. She was ill for three days. There's no doctor here, and I couldn't afford to take her to a doctor. Another girl died too for the same reason, and then a boy. All I could give him was medicine I had left over, but he died too. When was the worst time Mrs. De Silva can remember? I think it's now. There was a bad time too when I was a child, but now is even worse because I've got a lot of children and can't afford enough things for them. Food, clothes, medicine for them when they're ill. 
Wages around here are not enough. We plant the crops every year, but we hardly get anything from the land. Did Mr. De Silva plant crops last year? I did. Beans, corn and cassava. Did it work? No, it didn't. The rains didn't come. The area affected by the drought is a little larger than Britain. In all this, there is really only one important river, the São Francisco. It rises some distance to the south, where the climate is much wetter and flows northwards right through the middle of the drought zone. In an area where the vegetation is a dull, monotonous brown, it's hardly surprising that the blue course of a major river should play a special part in the life of the region. The people who live on the banks of the São Francisco consider the river as belonging to them. They call it Old Frank. It's a term of affection for a river that is their means of transport and their source of water for washing, drinking, cooking and irrigating their crops. In short, Old Frank is life itself. But in recent years, this special relationship between the Riverside people and their Old Frank has in several places been totally destroyed. A plan is underway to build nine dams across the river, most of them in the drought zone. This one is the latest to be finished. It was built at a place called Sobradinho. It is in many ways the most stunning sight ever to appear in the Kachinga, a perfect symbol of the large, expensive development schemes Brazil is so fond of. It cost 366 million pounds. It will eventually supply water for irrigation and is already generating hydroelectricity for the big cities of northeast Brazil. But 366 million pounds wasn't the only price paid for Sobradinho. What was once a section of the São Francisco River is now the largest man-made lake in South America. 75,000 people who used to live by the river have had to abandon their homes. Some of the most thriving riverside communities and some of the richest farmland in the dry zone are now beneath the waters of Lake Sobradinho. As the lake filled up to its final size, the electricity company built three new towns at the lake shore to rehouse some of the people who lived by the river. One of them is Nova Casanova. The town is bright, breezy and pleasant to look at. A tidier place than any of the old riverside settlements it replaces. Mrs Braga is one of the 5,000 people who were obliged to move from their old home by the river to a new house in Nova Casanova. She lives here now with her husband Joao, a farmer. Yeah. Yeah. Joao and his wife are more than happy with their new home, rented from the electricity company. But the rest of the story of their move from the river to Nova Casanova is a disaster. First, what about the compensation Joao got for his land? The land that was flooded by the electricity company? Joao explains. Well. The compensation they paid to people was very little. Mine was extremely low. 
I had a small piece of land with 23 fruit trees, coconuts, orange trees, guavas, mangoes and cashews. I had all that on my piece of land. And it was all flooded for next to nothing, for 58 pounds. João now has a new piece of land rented to him by the electricity company. It's 10 kilometers outside Nova Casanova, a long way from his home. And there was a problem with the land too. They said that they would offer a piece of land already cleared and fenced, but nothing like that happened. All they gave was five pounds and 400 meters of wire. And that's not good for anything. The piece of land I have managed to get into shape was cleared and fenced with the help of friends. The rest of Joao's new land is on a slope leading down to the lake. It's still in thick bush and covered in stones. And here is the biggest frustration of all. Joao's land reaches to the lakeside, but the water is virtually useless for irrigation. It's five meters below the level of the land it is supposed to irrigate and cut off from it by the thick bush. Is there anything Joao can do to lift the water that far? A não ser com o motor, né? Com a máquina. Only with a pump. A pump is the only way to get anything out of this land. And then I could make a little plantation and grow bananas, sugarcane, pawpaws, or whatever. But I can't afford to buy a pump. You see, the banks lend you money to buy that kind of thing. But I'm terrified of that sort of business. Terrified. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm afraid is that I might not be able to pay back the loan, go broke and end up with no land at all. See what I mean? Perhaps someone should have bought him a pump. But in a way, Joao was lucky. At least he and his fellow citizens in Nova Casanova got a new home and new land from the electricity company. But 40% of the people who lived by the river got scarcely any compensation at all. And they have been left virtually to fend for themselves like the people now living in the small village of Sao Consalu, 10 kilometers from the lake shore. Sao Consalu houses 30 families who used to live by the Sao Francisco River. Eight years ago, they were forcibly removed from their riverside land by the electricity company and left here to put up new homes for themselves deep inside the Kachinga. Six kilometers outside the village, the electricity company built a concrete water tank fed by water pumped up from underground. But the pump only works part of the time because the company doesn't deliver enough fuel to run it properly. <laughs> In Sao Gonçalo, practically all they talk about still is the move from the riverbank and the predicament they have been in for the past eight years. God and their own strength will see them through, they say. There are people in Sao Gonçalo who are almost obsessed about this disruption to their lives and will never forget it. Eu morava na margem do Rio de São Francisco. 
plantava na terra firme. I used to live on the banks of the São Francisco River. I used to farm land at the riverside and land on small islands in the river. I had plenty of water for drinking, for washing and for cleaning clothes. Eu plantava na margem do rio a cana. I grew sugar cane by the river, cassava, sweet potatoes, corn, beans, bananas, onions, garlic, vegetables. There was plenty of water for the land. Then I came here to San Gonzalo. We were moved here by the electricity company. We don't have water here. There is a little that we have to bring from almost one league away. When we planted crops, God gave us a lot of rain in February. But in March, April and May, there was no rain at all. We are in God's hands. We lost everything in the end. Nobody got anything from the land. We might go three or four days without any real food, only scraps. It's a miserable situation we're in. We're suffering here, here in San Gonzalo, in the middle of the Caatinga. The village of Pau Ferru untouched by dams and electricity schemes, sweats its way through the 40 degree heat of late afternoon. Of all the De Silva family's children, it is Carminia who is being groomed for a different kind of life in the future. She goes to school regularly and is pampered with the best set of clothes the family has and the only luxury in their house, makeup. What does Carminia eventually intend to do? I want to go far away, to Sao Paulo. I've heard about it on the radio. I think it must be good there. It's a big city, better than here. She wants to go there because her uncle lives there. She wants to go there because she thinks it's better than here. All she thinks about is going there. The uncle lives better than us. He works as a driver. He earns real wages. You can't do that here. She thinks life here is bad. We can't give her what she needs here in the countryside. She never stops talking about it. In the last week of August, six and a half months into the drought, Mrs. De Silva lost another child, her youngest, a baby girl. Malnutrition, contaminated water. My daughter fell ill and in five days she had a temperature and a cold. She was ill for five days and then she died. She had a very high temperature and a terrible fever, and she died that day. If I had been able to take her to the doctor, I think she would have been saved. I couldn't give her enough vitamins. I didn't expect her to die. 